Welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at some very basic grammar and particularly basic grammatical ideas around nouns. This is what you may have forgotten since grade four. What is a noun? Again, this is something we may have learned in elementary school, but uh, may also be afraid to admit we've forgotten. A noun is often in school defined as a person, place, or thing. And this is still a valid definition in English and in Greek, but thing has to be taken quite broadly. Some examples of English nouns are objects like house, keyboard, coffee, but also more abstract things like fire, thought is a noun, and rule. Thought and rule, those refer to very abstract, non-physical things, but they're still things. And so the words that refer to them are nouns, the words that name them. And people, like woman or firefighter, places like city, galaxy, or even corner. The two main categories of nouns, as you may remember, are proper nouns and common nouns. Most nouns fall into the category of common nouns. Proper nouns name a specific object in the world. So where the common noun woman refers to any example of, of the category woman, Mary is a proper noun that refers to one specific woman. Similarly, city is a common noun, but Toronto is the name of one particular city, so that's a proper noun. Planet is a common uh, noun, but Earth is the name of a particular uh, planet, and so it's a proper noun. Proper nouns in English are usually capitalized, and we do the same these days in Greek, not all the time, but often, but this is anachronistic. And so when you're reading Greek, remember that in the first century, and indeed right up until the last few centuries, there were no lowercase letters um, as distinct from uppercase letters. Even when the lowercase Greek letters were first invented, they weren't invented as lowercase. They were just a different way of writing the same letter. So you'll find Greek texts that don't capitalize uh, proper nouns uh, because actually that's a, historically more accurate. Nouns belong to a larger category called nominals. And nominals as a category includes nouns plus other words that act like nouns in a clause. What would those be? What other words can act like nouns? Primarily, we're talking about pronouns. So words like I, you, we, and it, um, but also things like demonstrative pronouns, this and that. And we're also talking about adjectives, which sometimes can act as a noun, as if it was a noun. Um, we call this the substantive use of adjectives. Uh, so instead of talking about somebody being red, we might talk about the red person or the red one. And uh, in Greek, you don't need person or one, you just say the red. Well, in those cases, adjectives in Greek in particular act as if they were nouns. In what way do these uh, behave as if they were nouns? Well, they play the same roles in a clause. Nouns, pronouns, adjectives, they can all be subject of a verb, they can all be direct object of a verb, etc. And so they all have the same cases, and they all tend to take different case endings. In, in fact, many of the case endings that you'll learn for nouns, you can apply directly to pronouns and to adjectives as well. That means that all of these kinds of words, nouns, pronouns, and adjectives, fall into the three main declensions, and they all have things like gender and number in common. 
So you'll sometimes hear me refer to uh, the role of a nominal in a sentence. And just remember that when I talk about a nominal, I'm talking about this big category of nouns plus any other words that can act like nouns, like pronouns or substantive. As I just mentioned, one of the things that nominals have is number. That means that nominals are either singular or plural. Singular nominals refer to one person, place, or thing. But more than one person, place, or thing is referred to by a plural nominal. The form of the word reflects their number, whether it's singular or plural. So the singular in English, house, is accompanied by the plural form, houses. And we know just by the shape of the word houses that we're talking about more than one. Planet is the singular, planets is the plural. Girl is the singular, girls is the plural. So in Greek, things work much the same way. Early Greek, earlier than the New Testament, also had a dual number that was used specifically when there were two of something. Uh, but this isn't really used anymore in Hellenistic Greek, and it doesn't show up in the New Testament. Nouns and other nominals also have gender. In many languages, nouns have gender uh, in a way that they don't in English. So a chair might be he, or the sun might be, as it is in German, she. If we, you've learned French or Spanish, this will be familiar to you from those languages. In French, for example, we have le chat, which is always le, always masculine, always referred to by il. On the other hand, we have la bibliothèque, which is always l. This, again, is unfamiliar to many English speakers. Usually in English, the only people and animals, uh, the only people and animals are referred to as he or she, and everything else is it. In other words, is neuter in gender. But we do, in a few cases, uh, use he or she for other inanimate objects, as when we refer to a ship as she. Some languages have just two genders, and. Uh, those would be masculine and feminine. This includes French, Spanish, and Hebrew. Other uh, languages have three genders, masculine, feminine, and neuter. Uh, and English, interestingly enough, uh, falls into this category, although we use the neuter gender for everything that's um, not uh, a person, anything that's an inanimate object. German, Latin, and Greek also have these three genders, masculine, feminine, and neuter, but they extend the masculine and feminine genders to cover all kinds of inanimate objects that we would consider neuter. So what's the relationship between grammatical gender and real gender? There's essentially no relationship. In French, every cat is le chat, masculine even though lots of cats are male and some are female. Every library in French is la bibliothèque, feminine. But buildings aren't really thought to be male or female. That's just the grammatical gender of the word. In words for people, uh, sometimes the grammatical gender fits the real gender. So in French, again, la femme is feminine and it means woman. L'homme is masculine, and it means man. But still, often, even with human beings, the gender doesn't fit the real gender of the people we're talking about. So l'humain, human being, in French, is masculine, even though it specifically refers to a human being of either gender. Les gens, people, is masculine plural, even though the crowd that it refers to, or the group that it refers to, may well include both men and women. In uh, uh, German, interestingly enough, das Kind, which means child, is neuter in gender, even though children, of course, are either masculine or feminine. 
What then is grammatical gender good for? If it's usually just a grammatical category that doesn't have anything to do with the real world, real gender, what's the point of grammatical gender? Well, it helps us to connect two related words in a sentence. If you want to review more of your basic uh, grammar about nouns, or if you want to learn a bit more about the details of Greek nouns, you can look in Mounts' Basics of Biblical Greek, and for the third edition I've given you the section numbers and page numbers here.